Hello, and welcome back to Common Law, a podcast from the University of Virginia School of Law. I'm Risa Galyuba, the Dean. And I'm Leslie Kendrick, the Vice Dean. Risa, I think we should just dive right in. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, so it's January 11th, 1964. This is a CBS News Extra on smoking and health, the findings of the Surgeon General's Committee. And President Lyndon B. Johnson, Surgeon General, holds this really unusual press conference at the State Department in front of a packed crowd of 200 journalists, bureaucrats, and businessmen. Now, at the time, 70 million Americans, that's about half the country, were smokers. And Dr. Luther Terry had some unpleasant news for them delivered in a 387-page report by a Blue Ribbon Committee. Out of its long and exhaustive deliberations, the committee has reached the overall judgment that cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to the United States to warrant remedial action. This and this is the first government document that basically says, hey, smoking causes cancer. This is historian Sarah Milov, whose new book, The Cigarette, A Political History, traces the fate of tobacco in the United States in the 20th century. She says Dr. Terry's press conference marked a turning point in how Americans viewed and regulated smoking. Even though we have this sense that, oh, in the Mad Men era of mid-century, everybody was smoking, that's not exactly accurate. But what is accurate to say is maybe uh, smokers weren't ubiquitous, but smoke was everywhere. Over 14 months, the committee had gathered data showing, among other things, that smoking was killing as many as 41,000 people a year, more than car crashes. Sarah told us this work was remarkable for a couple of reasons. In appointing experts to the panel, Terry asked professional associations to weigh in, but he also gave the tobacco industry veto power over who would serve on the committee. Then he went one step further. And so when the 10 men, and it was all men, on the committee were finalized, Terry insisted, because he knew it would be such a matter of public debate, that five of the 10 be smokers and five of the 10 be non-smokers. So this canonical document in public health was itself the product of a smoke-filled room. All the same, the committee's findings were unanimous. In no uncertain terms, Terry urged smokers to quit. He told children never to start. And above all, he pleaded with government agencies to do something about it. The other thing about this moment that struck me, Leslie, was that Dr. Terry's press conference was held on a Saturday because he wanted to make sure that his announcement wouldn't roil the markets. As Sarah told us, this shows how important tobacco was to the national economy. Of course, it was also crucially important to national politics. There was also the real and inescapable power essentially of Southern Democrats in Congress, many of whom represented tobacco growing districts or cigarette manufacturing areas. So it's fair to say that tobacco's presence in American political life in the 20th century was very outsized. As it turns out, in fact, despite the report's findings, there wasn't much government action on tobacco for years. In the immediate aftermath of the Surgeon General's news, Congress actually moved to curb the Federal Trade Commission's plan to mandate strong, clear warning labels on cigarettes. A new federal law toned down that language and blocked the agency from touching the issue for four years. I think one insight of the history of tobacco is it's not the science that stops people smoking. It's basically social activism. So what does this mean? Well, it means it's still going to be incumbent upon um, creative lawyers and later social groups if you want to see any remedial action on tobacco. So we're going to come back in a minute to our interview with Sarah Milov and explore some of that legal activism around tobacco, including actually its unintended consequences. That's right, Leslie. We thought this would be a really great story to launch season two, which we're calling When Law Changed the World. If you've been following the show, you know that last season we looked ahead to the future of law. We're kind of doing the opposite this time around. We're looking back and trying to understand how we got to where we are today on a lot of important issues. So throughout the season, we'll bring you stories about crossroads and legal history, diving deep into some crucial moments when the law and lawyers 
made a real difference. So I'm really excited about this season, Risa, and this opening episode, because I think they play so much to you as a legal historian and all of the expertise that you bring to that. Well, that's very kind, Leslie. I've been thinking as I look forward to all of our episodes that they're actually going to play to both of our strengths. There's a lot here about civil rights and civil liberties, about free speech and equality. So I think it's really going to bring out um, your, your expertise as well. I'm excited. Me too. So why don't we get back now to our interview with Sarah Milov, who's an assistant professor of history here at UVA. And let's pick it up where you were asking her about the legal landscape that took shape right after the Surgeon General's report came out. And a big part of your story is really about the interaction between federal agencies, bureaucracy, politics, and then the law, right? And not just the law, but also social activism. So tell us about the rise of that advocacy and that activism. Where does that come from in 1964 and after? Right. So we've got a scenario in 1965 and 1966 where the government said, hey, smoking can kill you. But Congress has basically hamstrung the ability of any agency to do something about that, or so it thinks. And now this might be of interest to uh, law students out there because it was the creative action of a very young, a 27-year-old lawyer um, just a couple years out of Columbia Law, whose name is John Banzaff. Um, he wrote a petition to the FCC, the Federal <laughs> Communications Commission, with a very creative argument. He said that, look, there is so many hours every day given over to tobacco advertising. Tobacco was the most advertised product on TV at the time. Tobacco, as the Surgeon General has said, is clearly a subject of public importance. We have this rule called the Fairness Doctrine that says that issues of public importance must receive free equal airtime. So if the tobacco industry is pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into tobacco advertising, well, then public health should get its own equal and opposite counter advertising. This was a pretty radical and creative absolutely, argument to be it, made. Absolutely radical and creative. Um, so in a decision that took everybody by surprise, probably Banzhaf himself as well, the commission basically says, yeah, this is a subject of public importance and the counter advertising won't get equal airtime, but they kind of made up a number here. Three to one ratio. This still resulted in, by one estimate, $80 million worth of free airtime for anti-tobacco advertising. So if any of you remember those kind of gritty truth advertisements of the late 90s and early 2000s, this, these in the uh, early, late 60s and early 70s were definitely the precursor to those. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Those kinds of uh, things. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yeah. those were the the the, the later ones. Right? Yeah. This um, I think actually it was more shocking to see some of the um, early anti tobacco ads. For example, you know, TV viewers in the late '60s would have probably been familiar with the show Perry Mason, and every week Perry Mason went up against a DA played by a man named Bill Tallman. Um, Bill Tallman lost every week to Perry Mason. Um, in this ad, which was shot with kind of a, a handheld camera in his backyard, so it's this very personal scene. This is the house we live in. That's Billy. You see his kids playing in a pool. Barbie looking after her brother Timmy. Um, he's talking through all that he has to, to lose. Um, Susan, our youngest. And my wife, Peggy, who looks after all of us. And at the end of the advertisement, he says, I've got lung cancer. If you're hearing this ad, that's because I've lost basically my biggest battle yet. So take some advice about smoking and losing from... Um, and when the ad ran, Bill Tallman was dead of lung cancer at age 53. Wow. So this was a, a very, you know, affecting... Um, Kind of affective uh, type of thing to see on TV, really to viewers who are not used to being addressed um, on that level. So wow. it, people remember these advertisements too when um, government surveys were done um, in the early 1970s about essentially the efficacy of these advertisements. People said basically these advertisements registered with them to help them stop smoking. 
So does that have a role in explaining the rise of social activism on this or how, how does it fit and where does it go from there? So the anti-smoking movement in the late 60s and early 70s, I'd say it's useful to think of them as running on two initially parallel tracks. So you have John Banzaff, who, after his Fairness Doctrine coup, ends up leaving his white shoe law firm, one of whose clients was, in fact, Philip Morris. So he may not have been a totally welcome presence at the office. <laughs> they couldn't have been happy about right. that. But he gets a job um, as a, a law professor at GW. He moves his operations um, to D.C., and he ends up using his students in a class that he called unfair trade practices, uh, basically to be little social activists. And he was modeling himself off of Ralph Nader, mm-hmm. where Ralph Nader had his raiders, Banzaf had his bandits. So Ralph Nader was the father of consumer advocacy in the right. United States right around this time. Right. Also a young lawyer also successful in using kind of splashy and inventive legal tactics to garner attention that would eventually change people's attitudes toward big corporations. And he ends up founding an organization uh, called ASH, Action on Smoking and Health. And initially, ASH was monitoring the extent to which news stations were being faithful to their obligations under the Fairness Doctrine. So a lot of what Ash does at first is basically making sure that the rules are being followed that Ash set in motion to achieve. So presumably that that enforcement role is often undertaken by government itself, right? But here he was kind of volunteering to make sure that the enforcement was happening. Wait, th- there was not as a robust consumer lobby, even though what they were trying to do was to countervail the power of very well organized um, business interests. So his law students end up um, pursuing the Banzaf method in class in a variety of ways. Basically, He gives them assignments to launch an action against an agency. Now, an action could be a petition, a protest that you get the media out to cover, or maybe even a lawsuit. And some of these end up getting kind of a lot of attention. So part of the Banzaf method is also to give your group a punny title. (laughs) Because why not? (laughs) Because why not? (laughs) So one of these groups was called CRASH. I do question the wisdom of this acronym for this particular issue, but it stood for Citizens to Reduce Airline Smoking Hazards. Ooh, they should have thought that one through a little bit better. Yes, but you'll thank them because this uh, was part of a Banzaf initiated petition to separate smokers and non-smokers on airlines. And um, this ends up being perhaps the genesis of the modern non-smokers rights movement. The goal of this petition essentially was to go beyond the consent-based paradigm that even Banzaf himself had relied upon with the FCC petition. I mean, the whole idea behind the fairness doctrine and really a warning label too, is that, okay, if we give you the information, you are able to make a choice about what you decide to consume. Now, the idea behind the the smoking section petition was that there are people who are affected by other people's decisions to smoke. And perhaps there's no place more enclosed where that decision is more effective to other people than an airplane. And so you are actually regulating the behavior of the smokers rather than simply giving information to smokers in the hopes that they will stop smoking. You, a smoker, can only sit in this section. You're regulating the behavior not only of the smoker, but also, the non-smoker. also of the airline. Right. And so the airlines end up trying to preempt this. They don't want to be told by the FAA or the Civil Aeronautics Board, um, another agency that uh, regulated air flight, what they can do on their flight. So they tried to preempt this, but they also didn't want to deal with the hassle of actually having to move bodies and seats and deal with squabbles between uh, smoking and non-smoking passengers. So they basically wanted to cordon off a very small section of the airline for non-smokers. It was easier for them uh, to regulate uh, non-smokers in a more restricted way. So am I the only one here who remembers being on an airplane 
with a smoking section? Oh, I remember. You do? Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I, you know, I was on a flight to Japan in the early 2000s and it still had a smoking section. Okay. And I remember thinking even at the time, this isn't that effective. I mean, yeah, there are sections, but you're still in this one very small (laughs) enclosed space and the smoke doesn't stay in one area of the plane. It was absolutely not effective. (laughs) However, Banzaf sought to achieve two things. First, somebody had submitted an even more stringent petition, Ralph Nader, to ban smoking overall in airplanes. But by kind of occupying this middle ground that uh, we'll just segregate smokers and non-smokers rather than banning it totally, Banzaf sought to make a more moderate position that also kind of meant he would be seen as the kind of um, champion of this cause. Uh, The other thing that's important to keep in mind is even if it wasn't totally effective by our standards of smell and sight today, it did remind people that they were non-smokers, that the way business had organized itself before was not on their side and that things could be done to change that. And so this was something that Banzaf sought to capitalize on. Uh, For example, Ash bought ads in newspapers that told readers of the newspaper to send comments to the Civil Aeronautics Board in support of the Ash proposed rule. And in fact, people did this. The CAB received more comments on this proposed non-smoking section than they'd received for any other question that had ever gone before the agency. It filled five uh, volumes in their record. So by the time that this becomes a rule, in part because of Ash's advocacy, people think, well, hell, it's about time. But that idea did not exist prior to kind of getting these wheels in motion. It sounds like another concept that it highlighted for people was secondhand smoke. The idea that this is not just a liberty principle issue where we're trying to affect smokers' own choices that affect only themselves, but that this is a harm principle issue where this is activity that imposes harms on third parties. And, uh, you know, it sounds like partly the science on that gets going. And then there's also this framing of the concept that secondhand smoke kills. And if you don't smoke, you're still exposed to these sorts of risks. Yeah, a couple things are going on. First, Banzaf does not succeed because he puts ads in a newspaper and some highly motivated individuals respond to them by petitioning an agency. What is happening in parallel, and this is kind of the other wing of the movement, are grassroots, decentralized, chapter-based activism in the name of the non-smoker. So this is the second track that you were talking about. Yes, yes. yes. Um, And so there's kind of a symbiosis between these chapter based uh, grassroots groups and ash. And in fact, there's also a symmetry in terms of their uh, desire to use puns. Uh, These chapter groups are called GASP, Group Against Smoking Pollution. And these really start off super grassroots. The first GASP chapter was formed in 1971 by... um, a woman named Clara Gowen who uh, worked inside the home and was basically motivated at first just to put up a non-smoking sign in her own home, to declare her own home as <laughs> off limits to smokers, which kind of tells you people felt cowed by smoking. And I don't think gender- that the smokers had the entitlement. Right. right. And I think the gender aspect of this is important here. Remember, it's not 50% or 42% of Americans that smoke. It's maybe half of men by the early 1970s and 30% of women. So Clara Gowen is motivated to stop smoking in her own home. And she's also very frustrated with the fact that she can't go out to eat with her family because her daughter has a tobacco allergy and there's no place they can sit in a smoke-free environment. So she gets together with some of her friends, again, largely women, and they basically start a letter writing campaign to local doctor's offices, just asking them, hey, do you think that you'd maybe proclaim your waiting room smoke free? Now, they write to 700 offices. They don't hear from very many, but 50 say, hey, sure, good idea. It's a pretty good investment, at least uh, at least in the beginning. By the mid 1970s, these GASP chapters have spread all around the country. And while they started in, you know, College Park, Maryland is 
uh, where the University of Maryland is, while they kind of start off in well-educated enclaves, they're by no means exclusive to those areas. And I take it that the gender component is not only about who smokes and who's affected by smoke, but also the early 1970s. This is the moment of the feminist movement and the rise of second wave feminism. So I, I'm guessing there's a relationship there, too. Yeah, the idea that these non-smokers rights groups had very much built off of the goals of the civil rights movement, basically to frame themselves as an oppressed minority that could take action into their own hands. Um, they also use the tactics of the feminist movement. Um, but many of these women might not have identified as feminists and some of them didn't work outside the home. But what they were trying to achieve was very much in line with uh, what feminists at the time were trying to achieve, which was a shift in consciousness by, by speaking together about their shared oppression as non-smokers, you could make people believe that they were a category of people called non-smoker and thus entitled to rights. Right. So, so it strikes me that there's a conceptual debt to the women's movement and civil rights, right? The idea that there are people with rights and the categories of people with rights are not set at one time. Right. There can be new categories of people with rights. And then in addition, the kind of strategic debt that they are building on the strategies of these other movements in the way they go about trying to not only call themselves people with rights, but actually have those rights and enforce them in some way. Precisely. And, you know, some of this was really tendentious. For example, there was a publication that they disseminated called the Non-Smokers Liberation Guide. Clearly, it's got its debts to other uh, rights movements um, happening at the time. But some of the strategies for achieving liberation were maybe something a little less than revolutionary. One strategy was, if you are somebody whose job requires you to speak in front of people, ask for the room to be non-smoking. It's a good idea. But if you're the kind of person whose job <laughs> asks you to speak in front of people, that gives you a clue to probably the class background of a lot of people in this movement. So they're very much in debt uh, to uh, the civil rights movement and the feminist movement. But there was a grandiosity to the types of claims they were making about the world historical importance of what they were doing without kind of reflecting on the ways that that their strategies ended up burdening those who were perhaps, you know, not as well situated as they were. So they had privilege as well they as had privilege. Right. Yep. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the, the burdens of what, what they're looking for and what they're uh, seeking to impose? So basically... Their idea was that grassroots activity would succeed more at the local level. And they were absolutely right about that. By 1977, hundreds of cities around the United States had passed what we would consider today mild, but anti-smoking ordinances nonetheless, separating uh, where people could smoke, which did further the movement's goal of moving the social default away from smoking. But what this meant in practice was at least sometimes to criminalize smokers, that sometimes these laws were written in a way that allowed for potentially pretextual policing of smokers who were uh, people of color. And so, for example, in Chicago, there's a smoker's court established. And one journalist visited the smoker's court because there was such a volume of um, these citations. And basically everybody who was there was a person of color. And they were only there, not because they needed to go to court for this level of offense, but basically they couldn't pay their fine. So that's an example. And I think actually you still see that today in kind of the class stratification of who continues to smoke. So one thing that strikes me in your book and in talking with you is um, we have conceptions today of what type of issue uh, tobacco is. And from a legal standpoint, I think people would say this is a products liability mm -hmm. issue. This is an issue primarily for regulation by the federal government. And within the federal government, it's an FDA issue. And the mm -hmm. other Actors here are the states and the state attorneys general settlement in the late 90s. But the story you're telling is one of, you know, the Surgeon General is involved, the FCC is involved, the FTC is involved, local governments are involved. You know, you see ordinances before you see action on the federal side. The issue has just evolved really over time 
And the box that it fits in now seems maybe predetermined, but it wasn't at all during this entire evolution of the issue. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it might surprise people to know now OSHA, you know, occupational health does not regulate workplace smoking. That is done at the state and local level. In part, that's because of the legacy of the non-smokers rights movement. Having successfully worked through local law, I think a lot of people in the non-smokers rights movement are very wary of federal regulation because some of the truisms that held in the 1960s, that is, Congress is a friend to the tobacco industry, continued to be true. So I think you you continue to see this um, in the way uh, people within the anti-tobacco movement conceive of the movement's history. And this this is still an issue, especially as you see the um, emergence of Juul and e-cigarettes as a new public health challenge. So can you talk a little bit about where that stands in terms of regulation and what kinds of lessons we might be able to apply to it? Yeah, I mean, kind of like with um, tobacco earlier in the 20th century, now the Surgeon General um, calls vaping an epidemic. And there's there's a real desire by anti-tobacco activists um, to require that e-cigarettes are regulated at the local level, just like cigarettes. So if you've got a local law, again, piggybacking off the success of the local ordinance strategy, that if you've got a local law that says no smoking, then that counts for e-cigarettes as well. Now, the vaping industry piggybacking off the uh, knowledge now that the way to fight local ordinances is through preemption is trying the state house strategy at kind of neutering uh, the ability of cities to restrict um, e-cigarettes in that way. And do you think that the arguments against vaping won't be as successful because there's not the same secondhand smoke aspect to it? I think that, you know, it took a very long time for evidence of secondhand smoke to emerge for tobacco. It took well, it took until the early 1980s and it wasn't until 1986 that the Surgeon General came out with its its own report on involuntary smoking. So I actually, you know, it's going to take a while for us to know the secondhand effects of vaping. But, you know, maybe one lesson of the non-smokers rights movement is that social activism and success at regulating smoking can actually come before the science. That was UVA historian Sarah Milo. Her book, The Cigarette, is available now from Harvard University Press. And what a book. What a conversation. Really interesting. So I was thinking the first thing that came to my mind was we've titled our season When Law Changed the World, and we're only in our first episode, but maybe that's the wrong title because it strikes me that this conversation and her book is as much about when the world changes the law as when the law changes the world. That seems completely right and completely characteristic of your approach, right? To see the interaction between facts on the ground, people on the ground, lawyers, the whole system and how that goes into changing the law. And then legal change can itself have lots of impacts on everyone after that. But yeah. it's not it's not unidirectional. It's not. It's dynamic. And it's what the what the law and society people would like to say. It's mutually constitutive uh, that the law and society around it are creating each other simultaneously. And there's this incredible dynamic between the two. And I think this book is such a a good example of that. And I think it's probably going to be a feature of a lot of the conversations that we have in this season, because it is just part of the way that the law works and the way the world works. But this, this book really highlights it. I agree. So you're a legal historian. I teach torts and products liability. There's so much there to think about from both of those directions. And then there's the fairness doctrine, which is just out of nowhere, a kind of First Amendment thing sweeps it gets in. both right? of your subject Super matter. Super interesting, right. So, you know, for any listeners who are wondering why the fairness doctrine doesn't get utilized in similar ways today, it was abolished in 1987. So in the 80s, the fairness doctrine is abolished and it no longer regulates uh, broadcast. They only ever regulated broadcast uh, radio and television. Of course, in the seventies, that was a big deal because you didn't have proliferation there of was, cable channels, right? right. <laughs> but um, yeah, it does. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, How and did it get abolished? 
Speaking uh, of law. The FCC abolished it under the Reagan administration. Um, but really interesting to see, you know, communications and, you know, all of these different tools being used to to address the issue of cigarettes, things that you don't think about from today's perspective. Yeah, I, I, the other thing that strikes me, uh, of course, situated as I am, is the importance of lawyers to the story. And it's not that they're the only important actors because the grassroots movements are, you know, there are so many key actors, but um, John Banzaff and the strategy he comes up with at the beginning, and then the use of his law students leading into more grassroots activism. There are a lot of lessons in this story, both for how lawyers can create change, you know, whatever kind of change they're interested in creating, and the importance of lawyers even beyond the litigation context, but how they interact with other forms of advocacy and other forms of change making. And I think that part of the story continues through the 90s, which was a, a part of the narrative that we didn't talk a whole lot about. But in the 90s, when lawyers at the FDA assert that um, tobacco is a product that they should be regulating under the purview of the FDA, you know, those are those are new legal claims that are being made that shift what box tobacco goes into. Um, and at the same time, you have the state's uh, attorneys general suits where, you know, the head lawyer of various different states, you know, upwards of, you know, more than 40 of them sued the tobacco companies, um, claiming that the tobacco companies are responsible for the public health costs, the, you know, Medicaid costs and Medicare costs uh, that the states are paying because of tobacco related illnesses. And, you know, these are, again, legal moves, lawyers reframing what tobacco is and, and rearticulating what the harms of it are. And that's precisely what folks have been trying to do with gun control more recently. And um, they've they've run into roadblocks because at the same time that lawyers trying to reform an industry learned lessons from the tobacco litigation, the tobacco anti-smoking movement, the industry itself learned similar lessons, right, and has figured out what moves they need to make in order to thwart the litigation that the gun control folks wanted to to use. But I think, you know, we're, we're in a moment where we're seeing um, the rise of some additional lawsuits of this kind. So um, there hasn't been an enormous amount of success on the guns front. Um, there's been lead paint litigation that's bounced around for a long time and seems right now to be uh, making a little bit more headway than it has. There's been climate change litigation that's taken on a similar shape since the 70s, but we're seeing kind of an uptick of that. And there's been just an enormous amount of opioids litigation that looks very similar to the tobacco litigation and is being taken on by, uh, you know, local officials and state attorneys general, again, very much in the same vein as the tobacco litigation was. And, you know, we're starting to see some documents come out that have a little bit of the flavor of the kind of smoking gun documents that also were a feature of tobacco litigation. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. It only just occurred to me, smoking gun. You got the, the smoking and the, and the gun right there, there in go. the same thing. There you go. So my hope is that every guest that we have this season will uh, provide such perfect symmetry <laughs> with your expertise in torts <laughs> and First Amendment, with my expertise in legal history and social movements, and uh, and may they all be quite this, uh, this integrated. So that's it for episode one, season two. Thanks for joining us on Common Law. We hope you'll stick around for more stories about when law changed the world and vice versa. If you're a fan or even a critic, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's the best way for listeners to find out about the show. You can also subscribe to the show on our website, commonlawpodcast.com. Find all our previous episodes and delve into some background on each topic. And be sure to tweet at us anytime at Common Law UVA. We'll be back in two weeks with eminent legal historian Ted White, who will take us back in time to World War II and its aftermath. A powerful argument is made by African-Americans who come back saying, I'm a veteran and I'm still being treated as a second class citizen. I can't go to a movie theater. You know, I can't ride on a bus. Here I, I fought for my country and, and that's just not fair. Common Law is a production of the University of Virginia School of Law. Our team includes Robert Armengall, Sidney Holloman, Virginia Kane, Mary Wood, and Alex Sieber. Special thanks to the Virginia Quarterly Review, where this episode was recorded. I'm Leslie Kendrick. And I'm Risa Galyuba. See you next time.